And about a week ago, a viewer contacted me about a comment I had made around 10 months ago, uh, 11 months ago actually, in one of Walter Lewin's videos regarding the fact that I was making a video on Faraday's Law and he was wondering whether I had uh, published it or if I hadn't published it, if he could view it. And I agreed to uh, let him view the video. I had not published it or uploaded it on YouTube because it was in modules. There were about 10 modules and I needed to stitch them together, which I've done. And even then, the video isn't complete as I had first intended it. What inspired the video is I came across a YouTube video uh, published by Dirk uh, Van uh, Merveni uh, in Holland. And the title of his uh, video was something like Walter Lewin's uh, Demo uh, Paradox Solved. And that kind of perked my curiosity, what that was all about. And upon viewing the video, I saw uh, many errors. And he also had referenced a experiment conducted by one of his colleagues, a Cecil uh, Mabildi. And they were referencing a paper by um, uh, Kirk McDonald from uh, Princeton. And... The video demo had several errors and difficulties in it, and I was going to cover that. I never did uh, produce that module. It is not in this particular video. I will be covering it here shortly in another video. But what this video is, is just a first pass at the Faraday's Law, uh, which is one of four Maxwell's equations. And I went through the formal definition of it uh, using vector calculus, the uh, implications. So it's a rough cut. It's not a final version. I am going to redo this video. However, I'm putting it out there for viewers to view and comment on if they find spots that uh, were difficult in understanding, bring it to my attention, or there's some points you would like me to further elaborate on, or things that I don't need to cover, feel free to make comments uh, so that I can take it all into consideration when I pre redo this video and produce a final version. Uh, in the next day or so, I'm going to be doing a, another video which will help viewers understand how to solve Walter Lewin's uh, uh, demo where he has a single loop uh, immersed in a changing magnetic field and how voltmeter leads can be rearranged to give you different readings and different ways of probing the circuit and how to easily solve these uh, circuit problems. Uh, many people out there seem to have an extreme amount of difficulty in solving these network problems, these circuit problems, and I'll show you how to go about doing it easily. Let's begin. Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction is one of four Maxwell's equations that describe classical electrodynamics. The Maxwell equations are vector partial differential equations in space and time. <clears throat> the point form or differential form of Faraday's law is that the curl of the electric field intensity E is equal to minus the partial derivative of the magnetic flux density with respect to time. The three other Maxwell equations are Ampere's circuital law, Gauss's law, and an equation that tells us that there are no naturally occurring magnetic monopoles. That statement is that the divergence of the magnetic field density is equal to zero. From that, we conclude that magnetic lines of flux always form closed loops and never uh, begin or terminate on magnetic charges like electro electric field lines do. There are electric charges, plus and minus, but there are no magnetic charges. 
if we apply Stokes' theorem to the differential form of Faraday's law, that's Stokes' theorem, it's a mathematical theorem that takes the uh, curl into a line integral, and if we apply the Stokes' theorem to this differential form, we get the familiar integral form of Faraday's law, that the line integral of the electric field intensity E over a closed path, this is going to be a closed path, is equal to the negative total time derivative of the magnetic flux density, which is, uh, or, or the total time derivative of the magnetic flux, which is, can be written as the magnetic flux density dotted with a differential uh, surface area, and this is integrated over a surface, and this is an open surface. Now, the open surface has a boundary that's defined by the closed path. Um, <clears throat> now, the closed path and the open surface that's defined by this closed path can be both translating, rotating, uh, uh, contorting, uh, stretching, contracting, uh, can have all kinds of gyrations. <clears throat> Stokes' theorem applies in these general cases where there may be relative motion between the closed circuit C and the changing magnetic field, or the magnetic field could also be static and you could have relative motion between uh, this closed path and a static field. <clears throat> this right side can be expanded out in terms of derivatives of the divergence and curl of the B field, but just like any operation that involves moving a derivative inside the integral, one must be careful when applying a Leibniz type rule to a multivaried, multivalued vector function uh, involving a uh, surface integral. I spent a considerable amount of time on this particular problem when I was in uh, my master's program at uh, Michigan Technological University, and I can assure you that Stokes' theorem does apply to surfaces that are moving and contorting. <clears throat> you can find information on this uh, on the expansion. Um, there was a hint on this in uh, Jackson's Classical Electrodynamics, which is um, a standard uh, advanced text. Um, he kind of mentioned this in a footnote, what additional terms might be, but it wasn't fully complete. Uh, but I'm not going to go into this, that, that the expansion of this is uh, rather involved. <clears throat> now, we um, can write Faraday's law in a shorthand way, which is familiar, we can write it as the EMF is equal to the time derivative of the magnetic flux. This is a shorthand notation of this, and from this we can see that the EMF, or what's called the electromotive force, is equal to the closed line integral on E dot DL. <clears throat> the electric field intensity is defined as a uh, force that acts on a unit positive test charge. This is the force that would be felt by that test charge when it is placed in an electric field, that the electric field intensity is the force 
per unit charge or the force felt on that charge. We, that is how we define the electric field. For example, if you had some, say, electric field in space and you uh, put a test charge in here, a positive test, char test charge called plus Q, then it will move in the electric field. There will be a force on it that will cause that charge to move within the uh, electric field. This is, say, our E field here. <clears throat> now, the work done by an outside external source on a charge in, uh, moves this positive test charge from one point to another point in an electric field. We can define the work Let's see here. Let's go over here. We can define the work done on this test charge as uh, it's moved within an electric field using the standard definition of work. Work is minus the line integral from, say, A to B of a force moving uh, along a path. So a force moving along a path uh, defines uh, the amount of work that's uh, performed. This is the definition, the physical definition, physics definition of work. And putting in for our force, force is just QE, we see that the work on a positive electrical test charge would be the integral from A to B of E dot DL. Now this isn't a closed path. The, these are just, say, if you went from a point A to a point B within the electric field and you move that charge, uh, the amount of work done in moving from A to B would be given by this path integral or this line integral here. Now the potential difference, V, uh, BA, which would be the voltage at the final minus the voltage at the initial starting point, is equal to minus the integral from A to B, a path integral, line integral, of E dot DL. This is the definition of voltage. And this is work per unit charge. That's how we define voltage in uh, electromagnetics uh, uh, and in electrical engineering. Now, voltage is a potential difference, and it's just work done on moving a charge within an electric field. So volts. The units on this is volts, and that is work per unit charge. So we define EMF then, or the electromotive force, as the closed line integral on E dot DL. And that's what we have here, E dot DL. This is just the electromotive force. EMF, the electromotive force, is a scalar measured in volts. So the units on this, again, is volts. And note that it is a voltage about a specific closed path. It's a closed path, like a loop, uh, and it has to be uh, uh, specifically called out. The EMF is path-dependent. Path in a non-conservative system. If any part of the path is changed, then the EMF in general also changes. And that's what we have here. Uh, this is an expression of a non-conservative non system. So if I change the path, 
the value of the EMF will in general also change. In a conservative force system, or uh, field system, uh, the result on the value that I get in computing a closed line integral will uh, never change. You always get the same value and that uh, value will be zero. It's equivalent to uh, stating that uh, 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 some of the voltages around the loop uh, always sum to zero, which is Kirchhoff's voltage law. Now Faraday's law is a departure from electrostatics where an electric field resulting from a static charge distribution must lead to a zero potential difference above a closed path. That is because in electrostatics the curl of the electric field is identically equal to zero. This is a statement of a conservative system. A conservative force field is one that has zero curl. The fact that Faraday's law tells us that the curl in general is non-zero tells us that we have a non-conservative uh, force field. <clears throat> in electrostatics, the line integral, E dot dl, leads to a potential difference. With time-varying fields, the integral on E dot dl results in an EMF or a voltage. Now this is very important. If you have, say, a changing magnetic flux, let's just say the flux is coming out of the board and changing in time, that a time-varying magnetic flux which we have here <clears throat> produces an electromagnetic or electromotive force or an EMF which may establish a current in a suitable closed circuit. An EMF is merely a voltage that arises from conductors moving in a magnetic field or from ch a changing magnetic field within a closed circuit. So, if this is a changing magnetic field, <clears throat> we, this would set up an electric current outside of the field. <clears throat> and if we had a conductor lying outside this field, then if this electric field that's induced in space would cause a current to flow. <clears throat> Faraday's law again is usually stated is the electromotive force is equal to the negative total time derivative of the magnetic flux with respect to time. This equation implies a closed path, although not necessarily a closed conducting path. That is an important point. <clears throat> the closed path might just be a purely imaginary line in space. Um, it could include circuit elements like capacitors and resistors or it could be uh, a conductor uh, in the path or uh, no elements or conductors at all, just um, an imaginary line out in space. But the important point to remember is whenever there's a changing magnetic flux it induces an electric field in the space around it. That electric field is always there. There might not be any current flow, but the electric field will be there. <clears throat> now, the magnetic flux is that flux which passes through any and every surface whose perimeter is defined by the closed path C and the uh, time derivative of a flux with respect to time, that is a rate of change of the flux that goes through this open surface that's defined by the closed path. <clears throat> a non-zero non -zero value of d phi dt 
may result from any one of the following conditions. One, you could have a time varying flux linking a stationary path. That is, we could have this flux varying and we could have a closed fixed path that doesn't change in time. That will induce an EMF uh, on that path, this changing field would. This is what we call transformer action, where you have a fixed path and you have a magnetic flux changing in time uh, within the uh, area, the loop area of that path. Another way you can have a uh, EMF generated is to have relative motion between a steady magnetic flux and uh, a closed path. So for example if I had say magnetic field lines like this and I had a loop that was rotating like on a, a generator this will generate an EMF as this loop flips around and cuts these magnetic lines of flux. That's another way to uh, generate an EMF and this is called generator action. So we have two actions that can generate an EMF. One is transformer action where we have a fixed circuit and a changing field and the other is the generator action where we have a fixed field and we have a moving circuit. There's relative motion between the field and the closed path. <clears throat> or we could have a combination of the two such as a time varying flux linking a changing uh, contorting path moving through the flux. <clears throat> the minus sign is an indication that the EMF is in such a direction as to produce a current whose flux if added to the original flux would reduce the magnitude of the EMF and this is called the back EMF. We can use the current flow concept to determine the direction of the EMF even though there may not be any current flow. It might just be empty space where there is no conductors for the current, current to flow. But we can use that concept to, to uh, determine the uh, direction of the induced EMF. The changing magnetic flux is always established uh, in such a direction as to oppose the uh, changing uh, magnetic flux. So we can see <clears throat> how this might work is say again I have this uh, changing flux here and I've established uh, a circuit around it. Now a changing magnetic flux always establishes an induced electric field. So I'm going to have some electric field out in here and <clears throat> uh, that electric field will be present whether or not there are conductors in the space outside the changing magnetic field. If a conductor is present, cur a current will flow because there's an electric field and electric fields move charges and we can see that in that current density J is related to the electric field through conductivity of a conductor, sigma. So J equals sigma E. Current, a scalar, is just the surface integral of J dot dA, where dA is the cross-sectional area of the uh, conductor. So if I have a conductor out here and let's just say it's a round conductor and there's a changing magnetic field there will be an electric field um, uh, induced into the conductor <clears throat> and that electric field will give rise to a current flow through the cur current density so if the current density is in the same direction as the electric field and this would be the surface area, the cross-sectional area. So if we take J times the cross-sectional area of the wire, we'll get what the total current is flowing in that wire. <clears throat> so the electric field gives rise to current 
through the current density J. Now let's assume that I have a long solenoid. A solenoid is a structure where we have a cylindrical conductor and we have a surface current flowing on that conductor. And within the solenoid there will be a magnetic field uh, set up along the axis of this long solenoid. <clears throat> now the way we um, can make long solenoids is uh, it's very difficult to set up a current flow in a sheet of current in a, uh, a sheet conductor uh, but we can wind wire around uh, in a long coil and we can wind many layers if we want on top of that uh, to simulate uh, the ideal solenoid and we can get very close to um, uh, building a uh, practical solenoid that behaves uh, close to ideal. Now, if we have a changing magnetic field, say we have an alternating current um, flowing in the wires that make up this solenoid, so we have a changing uh, B field, and the B field, say, is increasing, then an electric field will be set up in the space outside the solenoid. And it will be in this direction. We'll talk about how to get the uh, directions shortly. But there will be an electric field in the space outside the solenoid. Now a characteristic of a long solenoid is that there's no B field outside. B is zero. The magnetic flux and the magnetic field outside of the solenoid is zero everywhere in space. The ideal solenoid is infinitely long, uh, and we can um, generally approach that sort of thing if the length of the solenoid is at least uh, 10 times the um, uh, diameter of the solenoid, uh, say in a circular solenoid. If, if uh, the length to diameter ratio is 10 or greater, uh, uh, you get a pretty good uh, solenoid. So the field, the B field, magnetic field outside the solenoid is zero. So in this space between the outside of the uh, outer perimeter or outer surface of the solenoid and out in space, there's no B field here, but there is an electric field if this B is, uh, this magnetic field is changing in time. So an electric field gets set up everywhere in space outside here. And the um, electric field <coughs> is related through this. Uh, the EMF generated, or the E dot DL long integral, the value of the EMF is determined by the rate of change of the uh, magnetic flux. So if you look at this, you can see that uh, the EMF value is constant for a given rate of change of the magnetic flux. So this is constant and the line integral on E around the path has to give me the same EMF value regardless of the path that I take. So if I'm close in where my path is fairly short then E times the path length equals the EMF, but if I go out here where I have a longer path length, then necessarily the E has to decrease. If the path length goes up, the electric field intensity has to decrease so that the product remains constant. So this tells us that as we get out further and further from the solenoid, the electric field weakens. <clears throat> now the E field is established and set up in the space outside the solenoid by this changing magnetic flux. If we place a conductor outside, surround this solenoid with a conductor, say if I take a wire and put it around the solenoid, then the E field that was established 
penetrates the conductor and produces a force on the free charge carriers or the electrons uh, in that wire and it will uh, move the charge carriers to produce a current. And we can see that that the rate of change of the magnetic flux with time <coughs> gives rise to an electric field. This is set up in the space outside of the uh, solenoid and the electric field penetrates the wire gives rise to a current density which is related to the electric field through the conductivity and then from the uh, current density in the wire we get a current by integrating the current density over the surface area cross-sectional area of the wire I'll call this the A of the wire and this part is in the conductor so the time rate of change of magnetic flux always sets up an e-field out in space whether or not there's a conductor this is a very important point we'll be using that and if we place a conductor in the space outside the uh, changing magnetic flux we get a current established through the electric field moving charge carriers in the uh, conductor the free charge carriers move let's discuss briefly a little bit about the consequences of changing magnetic fluxes in the real world suppose you uh, have a wire that connects um, a, a signal source to some sort of a, a load out here and if you have a changing magnetic flux uh, such as um, uh, coming from uh, uh, electrical equipment around in uh, the home or in a, uh, a studio from transformers uh, machinery could be setting up a changing magnetic flux in the environment and you have this wire pair um, immersed in that magnetic field and from Faraday's law we know that it's going to uh, set up a uh, e-field within that wire the e-field is going to be um, <coughs> in this direction along the wires. Now we know that the E field integrated over a path link generates a voltage. That's what this is telling us. An EMF is generated by an electric field uh, over a path. Now if we have these uh, straight wires, a parallel pair like uh, a lamp cord, uh, an extension cord what will happen is that this changing magnetic flux sets up an electric field and the wire has some uh, resistance there's going to be current flow because we just showed that uh, whenever an electric field is present if a conductor is present and is within the presence of an electric field it sets up also a current so there will be a current flowing and from that current it generates a voltage drop and if this um, is say a sensitive electrical circuit this will cause interference or noise on the line uh, this is an unwanted signal this current if we have a load say some R load then the uh, interfering unwanted signal will generate a voltage in that load equal to the current that's induced in the wire times the load resistance and this could be a significant amount this is where what causes hum on your audio lines and that is you have this uh, extraneous pickup uh, caused by uh, uh, changing magnetic fields in the environment inducing an electric field in your conductors um, 
and producing a current flow that will create an unwanted voltage, say, uh, at uh, the input to your amplifiers, and you uh, quite commonly will hear 60 hertz hum. That's because the wiring in your home uh, has current flowing at a 60 hertz rate, produces a magnetic fields that induce extraneous uh, E fields in your uh, wiring. Now, one way you can reduce that effect is you take this wire and you twist it. So we have this wire and we're going to twist it in this fashion. So now we have our load resistance here and we have our source on this end. Now what does this do for us? Well, again, we have this magnetic field that this twisted wire is uh, immersed in. And look, let's look what happens. We get the same electric field generated uh, in this wire as we did with the uh, straight wire like on the uh, zip cord or extension cord. So our electric field gets induced around this path on each one of these loops. So we have several loops due to the twisting. Each one of these loops ends up getting electric field generated uh, around it. Well, let's look uh, what happens to the voltage that's induced now. Each one of these, all these electric fields generate a little current. There's going to be a little current flowing and it's going to create a voltage drop. going along the path here, here. So we'll get a little bit of voltage drops on each one of these sections due to uh, the induced electric field in the wire. Well, how about if we go from the positive end, say, of this generator to the positive end on the load? What do we get? Well, let's look at these voltage drops. We have plus, minus here, then this wire is coming down here. We encounter minus to the plus. Now we come back up on the twist. We're plus minus. Now we come down on the twist and we're minus plus. So each one of these is a voltage drop. But we see that the voltage drops cancel on each pair of loops. We have plus, minus, minus, plus. So the voltage here is zero. The voltage here is zero when we add everything up. So twisting your wires significantly reduces the pickup on uh, your lines when they're in, uh, immersed in a changing magnetic field. And the tighter you make these twists, so the uh, smaller you make these loop areas, uh, the more rejection you get on these extraneous signals. <coughs> now, one last thing on this is, say if I have a current carrying wire, and I have a current flowing along that wire, a current flow in a wire produces a magnetic field around that wire. If we look at the wire on end, the magnetic field looks like this. The flux on the magnetic field. I'm looking at the wire on end. We have concentric circles of flux lines. Now, if in this um, around this wire, see we have more flux lines as we go further out, they get weaker. Now if I take a <coughs> conductor and say loop and put it outside the wire, we have magnetic flux, this magnetic flux passing 
into that loop and it's going to generate an electric field um, into uh, the conducting path here in this direction. There will be an E field. This is Faraday's law where we have a fixed circuit and a changing magnetic field. <clears throat> that gives us gives rise um, to an EMF being induced because the flux is changing. Uh, we have magnetic field passing through an area so we have flux and that's changing with time if this I is an alternating current. So that's what we call our transformer action. Where we have a fixed circuit and a changing magnetic field. Now if I take another wire and put it outside the current carrying wire and say if I move it down with some velocity V, what's going to happen is that's going to induce an electric field in this wire that will push uh, the charge carriers and there's a relationship for that is that the force that a charge experiences in a magnetic field, a charge Q with some velocity V if you cross it with the magnetic field that tells you what the force is on that charge. Well, force per unit charge is our electric field induced. And that is equal to V cross B. So, the what we call this motional electric field is produced by moving a wire in a magnetic field. And this is what we call generator action. <coughs> and if you look, my B field, uh, a as I'm moving uh, the conductor, I'm cutting these lines of forces. Basically what you're seeing is looking on end is we're moving this wire out in this direction, V. Well, our B is in this direction, so V cross B, using the right hand rule, gives me a electric field induced in that wire coming out of the board. So looking at this V, V cross B gives me my motional electric field in that direction. So there's two ways that uh, electric fields get generated due to time changing uh, magnetic fields. One is the transformer action where we have a fixed circuit and the magnetic flux changes in time and the other is generator action where we have a fixed flux field and we move a wire to cut the lines of force or the magnetic flux. Uh, and that will also generate um, an electric field which will generate a current in the wire. Let's talk a little bit about the magnetic flux density field, the B field. <clears throat> this surface integral on uh, the magnetic flux expresses the amount of magnetic flux that passes through some surface as like a flow of water or a flow of air. Um, it's the amount of streamlines or the magnetic field lines that pass through the surface. Now magnetic flux density B is flux per unit area. Hence the name magnetic flux density. <clears throat> It has units expressed either in Gauss, which is designated as cap G, or in Teslas, which is cap T. Now Gauss is a very small unit. Uh, one Tesla is 10 to the fourth or 10,000 Gauss. Um, the Earth's magnetic field is about um, a half of a Gauss very weak. <clears throat> Give you some other ideas. Your uh, refrigerator magnet, typical refrigerator magnet is about 50 gauss. Uh, these real strong neodymium magnets that you can get, they tend to be on the order of a half a tesla to 
one and a half Teslas. Uh, half a Tesla is 5,000 Gauss, so it's about 10 times, 100 times stronger than a refrigerator magnet. And an MRI scanner uh, typically has magnetic fields on the order of 7 to uh, 12 Teslas. Very strong fields. <clears throat> Let's determine what the units of D are. We have that E dot DL is equal to the negative time rate of change of the magnetic flux. Now, the process of integration doesn't affect uh, the uh, dimensions of the integrand or uh, on the differential. Uh, for example, if you had something like the integral of x squared dx, that's equal to x cubed over 3, well, Say if x is length, this is length cubed, and that's the same as the product of the integrand with the differential. Uh, this has length squared, this is length, so the differential times the integrand is uh, length cubed, which is the same as what you get when you integrate it all out. And the same thing happens with these uh, vector integrals. So if we look at E dot dl, This is going to have dimensions of E, the electric field times length. <clears throat> and if we look at the uh, flux, time derivative of the flux, then D dt on V dot dA is going to go into dimensions of, we'll have B which we're trying to determine, times area, which is length squared, and we're taking the derivative of that, so we divide by time. So equating these two, we end up with EL equals VL squared over time. Um, <clears throat> one, one of the lengths cancel. So we have E equals V L over T. Um, now the electric field we know is force per unit charge. And force is um, <coughs> equal to mass times acceleration. So this is mass. Force is mass times uh, acceleration, which is length per time squared. Mass times acceleration is force, and then we divide by Q. So now um, <clears throat> we can equate this with that. Solve for B. B is mass times length over charge times time squared. We bring the time up and divide by length. The lengths go out, one of the times go out. So the unit on the uh, magnetic flux density is mass per unit charge per time. So this would be in the MKS system, the mass um, meter, kilogram, second. This mass is kilograms. Uh, charge is in coulombs, and time is in seconds. So the magnetic flux density has units of kilogram per coulomb second in the MKS system. Now let's consider Faraday's law right here. Now we have to be concerned about the signs. When we do these integrations, we have a minus sign here. We have to get our uh, direction and the path set up uh, in the line integral properly so that all the signs work out. I'm going to show you how you do that now. In order to get the signs to work out, there's conventions that we use to go from the line path integral to the uh, surface integral. 
and we use what's called the right hand rule. The right hand rule establishes the proper orientation for the closed path and the normal surface normal vector uh, to the surface. So assume, let's take a general path. This is our closed path C here. And if I choose a direction on that path, the positive direction for a closed path is as you walk around the perimeter or along the path, you want the interior of the area in that path to be on your left side. So the positive direction in this case would be counterclockwise. This would be my DL uh, length vector, differential length vector. Uh, the positive direction for that. Now, <clears throat> the differential surface area is given by the right hand rule, meaning that if I take the fingers of my right hand and point them in the direction of positive path, then the thumb points in the direction of the positive surface vector. So in this case, my positive surface vector, dA, will be pointing outward from the surface because the fingers are going in the positive path direction, thumb points outward. If I reverse direction on my uh, path, then my thumb would be pointing in, the surface normal would be pointing into the board. <clears throat> now, the relationship between the closed path C and the open surface S is that the we can choose any surface we want as our open surface. And, but that surface has to be bounded by the closed path, meaning I could attach a bag to this. See, any surface like this. This would be a bag <clears throat> like that. And this is the opening to the bag. You can kind of imagine an opening there. Uh, the opening to the bag is defined by the closed path but I can have any surface I want attached to this. It could be a small surface, this could get ballooned way out. Any sort of surface can be attached to the closed path. There is no um, uh, <coughs> uh, preferred um, surface, if you will, that's uh, attached to the path in general. But uh, the geometry of the problem that you're trying to solve will determine what you want to choose for uh, the surface. Now, this could the surface could just as well just be a flat plane. It could just be this flat plane attached to the perimeter or this bag. It doesn't matter what surface is attached to the closed path because the amount of flux that's passing through this is always going to be intercepted by the open surface, no matter what it is. Um, the amount of flux that passes through the opening will remain the same regardless of what kind of a surface I attach to it. <clears throat> so the closed path defines the boundary of the open surface. And like I said, the surface can be any type of bag uh, as long as the opening is defined by the closed path. It doesn't matter. The same amount of flux passes through all surfaces that have the path contour uh, as its bounded perimeter. <clears throat> now, how you choose this surface for integration depends on the geometry of the problem. If, say, your B field um, is uniform, and if we look on end and say <clears throat> it's like what's coming out of a solenoid, <coughs> then if I want to compute the flux, it would make sense to choose a circle that surrounds it, uh, that's equidistance from the center. 
uh, because that would be easy to integrate out. Now I could choose any other um, uh, contour path and a uh, surface, but it might be a real bear to try to integrate because the geometry doesn't fit the problem. <clears throat> so normally the geometry of the problem will indicate to you what you want to choose for uh, your closed path and uh, the surface that is attached to it, much like you do with Gauss's Law. <clears throat> we'll now do a, a very simple problem to illustrate the procedure, say, and if we want to find what the induced electric field is outside uh, a solenoid. Uh, here I have a solenoid. Uh, we have uh, current flowing in the uh, solenoid to produce a magnetic field. The magnetic field is coming out to the left here. And I'm going to choose uh, a path around which I'm going to compute the electric field that's induced in the space around the solenoid. So first I'm going to do is just choose a positive direction for um, the uh, differential path length. And I'm going to be going, say, counterclockwise. This is the positive direction for our differential path length. Well, as we said before, the differential path length and the differential surface area vectors are related to one another by the right-hand rule. So counterclockwise is the positive direction for differential path length, then the positive direction for the surface normal is out of the board uh, in the same direction as B. Let's assume our coordinate system will choose the x-axis going down the axis of the solenoid. So positive AX direction is going to be out. So this will be my positive AX direction. <clears throat> now, the B field Say it's changing in time in some prescribed manner. I don't know what it is. You could choose it. And it's uniform. Uh, because this is a solenoid, the B field all through the cross section of the solenoid will be the same. It, it's uniform. It doesn't change magnitude with position. So I can write the B field vector as some function on time on the scalar magnitude of B in the AX direction, the positive AX direction. <clears throat> now, the differential uh, path length, DL, is in the positive V direction. I'm going to use cylindrical coordinates because it fits the cylindrical nature of the solenoid. And the electric field, by the symmetry of the problem, we expect the E field to be everywhere constant in magnitude on a circle centered about uh, the center of the solenoid. So everywhere on this path, the E field is going to be constant. That's one of the key tricks that we use, just like with Gauss's law, is in order to perform this integral, we'd like E to be constant or zero uh, along sections of the path uh, so that this um, dot product comes out nice and we can perform that vector integral. So the E field, it, let's assume it's in the opposite direction to the differential path length. E is uh, uh, going clockwise, the induced electric field, and I'm going to express that as some magnitude on E. This is what we're going to solve for. This is our unknown. And it's in the a theta direction and minus. The positive a theta direction is counterclockwise, so the E field is opposite, so it's in the minus a theta direction with some magnitude E. The differential path length is just, uh, th that vector is the scalar DL in the positive a theta direction. <coughs> That's this. And our differential surface area, dA vector, is just the scalar magnitude 
also in the AX direction along with B. So now we can perform the integrations. <coughs> the closed line integral of E dot DL will be minus E A theta. That's our E field, and we're going to dot that with our differential path length, which is DL in the A theta direction. <coughs> and that is going to be equal to minus the total time derivative with the total time derivative of the surface integral of b dot dA. Well, b is b of t in the ax direction, and I'm going to dot that with dA, which is the magnitude of the differential surface element times AX. Well, we see what we have here in the dot product. We have A theta dotted with A theta. Any unit vector dotted by itself is just unity, so I could rewrite this as, uh, <coughs> pull the minus sign out, we have E, DL, those are our scalars, and we have A theta dot A theta, and this is 1. And this is equal to minus the time derivative of the surface integral, and the same sort of thing here. B of t is the magnitude, that's a scalar, times the scalar magnitude of the differential surface area, and then we have Ax dot Ax. And again, this is unity because any unit vector dotted by itself is 1. <coughs> so now we have uh, our minus EDL, this is a scalar integral around a closed path, is equal to minus the time derivative of the surface integral of B of T times DA. <coughs> All right, now, uh, let's just get rid of some of this. Get rid of this portion here. So let's bring this up. Now, the differential length, since we have um, a cylindrical system, if we go out some radius r from the center of the solenoid out to the path, the differential l, in this case, dl, will be r theta. That's arc length. So our dl is just r times some differential theta. That's the uh, differential path length. And our differential area is we're going to integrate over here. So we might as well, um, <coughs> uh, again, we can use the um, cylindrical coordinate system, and we can go out our differential area in the polar coordinate system is just um, <coughs> the um, little patch that we have here. This side is differential r, and then this side is r d theta. So this is just r d r d theta. That's our differential um, area element. So now let's put them in here. We have minus the closed line integral of E, uh, which we're solving for. DL is R D theta. And this is equal to minus the time derivative of surface integral of B of T times differential area, um, which is R dr d theta. Now, B is not a function of R or theta, and it can be pulled out, and neither um, uh, <coughs> um, R E is not a function of theta, because we've assumed 
that everywhere along this path, as we go around in the theta direction, that the E field is constant. So I can pull the E field out. So we have E around the closed um, <clears throat> path is equal to minus. And I can pull the B out since it is not a function of R or theta. It's just a function of T. So we've got B of T from R dr d theta. Well, what is this? If we integrate out, if we go around the closed path, the theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. So that just becomes the perimeter, 2 pi r. And that's what we get here. This will be now <coughs> minus e times 2 pi r. This That's just the perimeter of the closed path. We can pull r out and integrate theta over from 0 to 2 pi, and that's the result. Then we have minus the time derivative of b with respect to t. And what's this? Well, <clears throat> that's just the area of the solenoid. If we integrate out from 0 to the um, perimeter, outer perimeter of the solenoid, and swing this differential element around 2 pi, we just get the area. We'll just call this the cross-sectional area. So this will be um, oops. So this is just the cross-sectional area of the solenoid. I'll call it the area of the solenoid. So solving for E, the minus sines cancel, and we have E is equal to the area of the solenoid divided by 2 pi r times d b dt. So you tell me the magnitude. Uh, of B and how it changes with time. You give me the cross-sectional area, and I'll tell you what the value of the E is as a function of R, uh, radial distance out. So E is just a function of the radial distance out, and so that's our solution. So this illustrates that you want to pick your path and the surface to fit the geometry of the problem to make the integrals come out easy. Earlier, I discussed the relationship between the closed path that's used in the line integral on E dot DL with the open surface that's attached to it that's used in the surface integral to determine the magnetic flux. If we have, say, a closed path C, then The um, way we establish the uh, directions for the positive differential path length and the differential area is as follows. The positive direction for the differential path length is in the direction such that as I go around the path that the interior to the path is always on my left side. So in this case, if I go in a counterclockwise direction, my differential path length would be in the counterclockwise direction. So as I go around, the interior is to my left. So this is the positive DL direction. Now, these open surfaces are attached to the closed path in such a manner that the closed path is, say, the opening of the surface. You can imagine that a bag is attached to this closed path such that the path defines the opening to the bag. We can have any number of surfaces attached to the closed path. There's an infinite number, and which surface we use depends on the geometry of the problem. Now, the differential element of area is chosen such that if I, I take the fingers of my right hand and curl the fingers in the direction of the positive differential path length, 
then the thumb points in the direction of the differential area. So in this case, the differential area will be coming out of the board. My fingers curl in the direction of positive differential path, the thumb comes out. So that's the direction of positive differential area. Now the situation isn't quite so clear and clean between the E field and the B field, but fortunately we have uh, a way to uh, uh, do it by using what's called Lenz's Law. Now, Lenz's Law gives us a surefire way of getting the signs proper. We do not really need to pay attention to all the orientations to determine the direction of the EMF, uh, the electric field, or any current that results uh, when we put a conductor, nurse a conductor into the electric field. We can use Le Lenz's Law to tell us the directions. Lenz's Law states that a change in magnetic flux through a surface <clears throat> always produces an EMF, an electric field, in such a direction as to establish a current that sets up an opposing flux to the change. We say that the EMF, the electric field, and any resulting current are induced by the changing magnetic field. We use the right hand rule to determine the current direction and we do it in this fashion. Suppose this magnetic field as before coming out of the solenoid is increasing in time. So it's coming out and increasing in time. Lenz's law tells us that the electric field is going to be such a direction that if it establishes a current that current is going to set up an opposing flux. So if this field is coming out and increasing, we need to establish a flux that opposes it. So the fingers of the right hand, you can think of being magnetic field lines, and they're going to be opposite to what uh, uh, of the field, the originating field. So our fingers go in to the solenoid, and the thumb then points in the direction of the electric field. <clears throat> now, this is if the magnetic field is increasing. What happens if the magnetic field is still coming out of the solenoid, but decreasing in time? Well, if the, elect the magnetic field is decreasing in time, then the induced field will want to try to bolster that up and keep it from collapsing. And the way it would do that is to generate a flux that will aid the collapsing field to try to make it stronger. So in that case, our fingers point in the direction of the B field and the electric field would be in the opposite direction. <clears throat> our fingers represent the induced flux. Now, Let's look at this another way. If we take our closed path, like we have here, establish a positive direction for our path length by keeping the interior of the path to our left as we go around the path, then our thumb points in the direction of the positive differential surface element, and <clears throat> The flux, if the flux is in the direction of our differential element and increasing with time, then it would produce an average value of the electric field that is opposite to the positive direction of the closed path. Okay, recap that. We've used the conventions to establish positive path length, and differential uh, element of area. Now, if the B field is in the same direction as the differential element of area and increasing with time, then the E field is in opposite direction 
to the positive differential pathway. And that's what we condition we have here. Field is increasing and in the direction of the differential element of area, so the electric field is going to be in the opposite direction to the positive differential pathway. So if you set up your path lengths and differential element of area according to conventions, then you can uh, establish the electric field as being uh, opposite in direction to the differential path length if the changing magnetic field is in the same direction as the differential element of area and increasing. But if it was decreasing and in the same, then we flip it around. So the right hand relationship between the surface integral and the clothesline integral should always be kept in mind during your flux in integration and your EMF determinations, but you can always use Lenz's law to bail you out, wait till the very end, just do everything in terms of magnitudes, and then use Lenz's law to fix it up for you. This discussion of Faraday's law will now be concluded with a few examples. Consider here, we have uh, a number of perfect conductors in the XY plane. Uh, and lying on top of these two conducting rails is a moving conductor that's moving with velocity v in the y direction. And back here we have a ideal voltmeter of very, very high impedance, so it draws no current. All conductors are assumed to be ideal, perfect conductors, no resistance. The B field is uniform and constant, that is, it doesn't change with time or position, and it is normal everywhere to the XY plane. Now let's determine what the voltmeter is going to read in this case as this conductor slides with velocity v along the rails. Now, <clears throat> the flux here is just b times the loop area of the circuit. So, the um, Magnetic flux here is just B times the area. So we can pull B out of the integral and then we're just integrating over the area. So this is B times the area. The width of the loop area is W. We go from zero to W. And the length is the current position in Y. So B will uh, the flux would just be B times the width times Y. Okay, the time derivative of the flux is the derivative of this. B and W are constant with respect to time, but Y changes. So the EMF is minus the partial or minus the uh, derivative of the flux with time. And this will be minus B W dy dt. But dy dt is just the velocity. So emf will be minus b w v. dy dt is the velocity. <clears throat> now emf is defined as the clothesline integral of the electric field about the circuit. And there is a conducting path that we're dealing with here. So we can determine E at every point along this Coles path at any time. In electrostatics, the curl of E is equal to zero. <clears throat> and from this, we can show that the tangential component 
of the electric field is zero at the surface of a conductor. And likewise, for all time varying conditions where we have um, uh, electric and or the magnetic fields changing with time, the tangential component of E at the surface of a perfect conductor, a perfect conductor is where the conductivity is infinity, so the tangential component of the electric field at the surface of a perfect conductor is also zero. So this implies that the tangential component of V is equal to zero at the surface of a perfect conductor. This is equivalent to saying that all of the conductors in this circuit are perfect and are equivalent to being a short circuit. They're all short circuits. <clears throat> the entire closed path now may be considered as a perfect conductor with the exception of the high impedance voltmeter. <clears throat> the computation then of E dot DL must then involve no contribution along the entire moving bar, both rails or the voltmeter leads. So any part of this circuit will not contribute to E dot DL because they're perfect conductors and can't su support a tangential component of the electric field. <coughs> so if we integrate <coughs> in a counterclockwise direction, keeping the interior of the positive side of the surface to our left as we go around the circuit. So our DL will be in that direction. That's a positive direction for differential uh, path length. DL. That is we're going to go around the circuit keeping the interior of the positive portion of the surface to our left. That defines the positive direction of DL. <coughs> that being the case, using the right hand rule, curling the fingers around the positive path direction, the thumb points in the direction of the positive differential area which is in the positive Z direction. This is the positive AD, Z direction up that way. <clears throat> now, the contribution then, since there's no contribution of E dot DL along the perfect conductors, the contribution of E dot DL across the voltmeter must be equal to the MF. <clears throat> so our EMF, which is the time derivative of the magnetic flux with time, the negative of that, is this value. Now B, let's look at this from uh, uh, one way just to uh, verify this. B is in the same direction as our positive surface area and it's um, <coughs> in <coughs> excuse me, increasing so that E must be in the direction opposite to the differential positive differential um, path length. So our E field then must be in this direction going around the circuit. Our E is pointing that way. It's going oriented counter or oriented clockwise. Because again, we established a positive path length uh, using the convention of having uh, the interior of the loop area to our left as we traverse the path. 
that establishes our differential area in the positive direction we find that our B is in the same direction as the differential area hence the electric field has to be pointing opposite to the direction of the differential path length. <clears throat> now we can verify this by using Lenz's law. Now if we allow a small current to flow in the direction uh, of an E field then that current has to be in such a direction as to set up an opposing flux. Well the flux is coming upward in the Z direction the opposing flux using the right hand would be pointing downward hence the thumb points in the direction of the E field which we just found so either by in, in Lenz's law or using uh, uh, line integral and surface integral conventions we get the uh, direction of the E field as being in the clockwise direction well with the E field in the clockwise direction then that shows us that this terminal terminal 2 of the uh, voltmeter should be the uh, positive terminal if we want the voltmeter to have an upscale reading so if this is the red lead of the voltmeter this is the black lead we'll get an upscale reading on the voltmeter <clears throat> now comment here is though this seems simple there are a number of contrived examples in which the proper application of Faraday's law is difficult <clears throat> These usually involve things like sliding contacts or switches like with a uh, DC motor commutator. Uh, these puzzles that uh, arise using uh, Faraday's law or trying to solve it using Faraday's law almost always involve uh, the substitution of one part of a circuit for another part of a circuit and I'll show you how that uh, comes about <clears throat> Let me look at that so now let's consider another circuit I will now illustrate the substitution of circuit with this simple little example consider the following simple circuit we have an ideal voltmeter attached to a circuit made up of ideal conductors. All the wires here are ideal. <clears throat> They're uh, perfectly conducting and we have an ideal voltmeter and <clears throat> we have a switch here in the network. Now let's assume that we have a B field that's uniform and static. It's not varying in time at all. It's perpendicular everywhere, normal everywhere to the plane of the circuit. This is our B. <clears throat> it's constant and uniform. Now, at time one, the switch is closed. So this part of the circuit is taken out. Now all the voltmeter sees is this area. We'll call this part of the network area 1. We'll call this part area 2. Now at time equals 0 the switch is closed. And what is our flux? The flux is just B times area 1. Now at T equals 0 plus the switch is open and now with the switch open the voltmeter sees the total circuit 
or the loop area of A1 plus A2. So then the flux, magnetic flux that the voltmeter sees is B times area 1 plus area 2. So the flux has increased the minute the switch has uh, been opened. <coughs> now, be before the switch was open, this was all static. There was no changing flux at all. The, the B field is constant, no time varying going on. The, switch, the circuit isn't moving, so there's no relative motion. So the voltmeter will read zero in this case because there is no changing flux. Now, at T equals zero plus, the switch opens, and what happens to the voltmeter? The flux is increased. Is the voltmeter going to flip, uh, flicker or anything? No. The voltmeter is still going to read zero, even though the flux has increased when we've opened up the switch. The change in flux has not been produced by either a time varying B field or a conductor moving through a magnetic field. Instead, all we've done here is introduced a new circuit that has been substituted in for the old. We started off with the old, with this circuit, and now when the switch is uh, opened, we substituted this old circuit with a new circuit. <clears throat> so, the lesson here is that one must be careful when evaluating changes in flux. The separation of your EMF into two parts um, usually involve one do, there's two ways we can induce an EMF. One is due to a time rate of change in the B field, in the magnetic field. This is called transformer action, where the circuit is fixed and we're just changing the uh, flux due to the change in uh, magnetic field. That's called transformer action. And the other is when we have a fixed field and we move the circuit relative to it. There's relative motion between the uh, closed circuit, the closed loop, and the magnetic field. This is called generator action. Now, these changes are somewhat arbitrary in that it's dependent on the relative velocity of the observer in the system. A field that is changing with both time and space may look constant to an observer moving with the field. Interesting problems arise when you apply special relativity theory to EM theory. So the application of Faraday's law, you have to be very careful to account for how flux is being linked, how flux is changing, relative motions between observer and the network, um, and these things can get rather complicated and if you don't apply uh, Faraday's law properly you'll end up with seeming paradoxes and that's basically what's happened with uh, Professor Lewin's uh, demonstration where uh, people are uh, um, challenging Professor uh, Lewin's analysis and I'll now go into that and show that Professor Lewin is correct in his analysis and uh, any objections to uh, the results that uh, he's derived is due most likely to uh, misunderstandings or misapplications of uh, Faraday's law. So we'll now get into that.